go even harder. Seriously? Yeah. That's Atlas, the super famous robot that does parkour and throws stuff in these incredible videos from Boston Dynamics. And I'm about to shove it as hard as I possibly can. And then, to be fair, I'm gonna get shoved the same way. I'm here with Atlas for a little friendly competition to see what this robot can really do. And to answer a question that I've had since I was a kid. When are all the robots coming? You know, like C-3PO and Sonny from iRobot and the Iron Giant, the human-looking machines that can help us do more than we can by ourselves, as long as they don't try and take over. For most of my life, humanoid robots have seemed pretty far away, but recently, not so much. Tesla, Boston Dynamics, Honda, NASA, and a bunch of startups are all making huge leaps in this field. So. In this video, we're gonna take you to the cutting edge of humanoid robots to show you what they can actually do right now and what you can expect in the robot future that's coming. Humanoid robots. Humanoid robots. Humanoid robots. Imitation of life. Machines that resemble people as closely as possible. Robots playing a larger role in our lives. Well, how do we prevent robots and humans from being in conflict? How do I look? Let's do this. I've wanted to meet Atlas for years. I'm one of the hundreds of millions of people who have watched this robot on YouTube. But getting into Boston Dynamics is hard. I've been trying for months, and finally, as a last ditch effort, I just tweeted asking anyone who watches this show for help. Through this community, we were able to connect to the right people, and finally, Boston Dynamics said yes. So, you're the reason I get to be here. Thank you for making this dream of mine come true. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for taking the time. We're excited to have you. So, this is the Atlas Lab. Do you recognize it from I do. Our YouTube videos? I do very much. Nice. Can yep. I meet yep. Atlas for the first time? Yeah. Do you still feel this way when you Oh, I love it. Atlas. Every day, I love this robot. The reason that I wanted to meet Atlas so badly is that this robot represents the much larger effort across many companies to build machines that resemble us, that walk on two legs and use arms and hands and can do some of the same things that we can, and maybe even things that we can't. If you understand Atlas, you can understand what's really happening with humanoid robots as a whole. Let's start with some anatomy. Head, shoulders, knees, and toes. But for robots. Atlas's eyes are where you'd expect, and this is what the world looks like to it. Atlas's brain, though, is not in its head. It's in its chest. Atlas has uh, three computers inside of its torso, each of which is the equivalent of uh, you know, a beefy laptop, basically. Also, Atlas was kind of short. I didn't realize that I would be taller than Atlas. Yeah. But Atlas is built. This version of Atlas is 4 foot 11 inches or 1.5 meters tall. That's about the height of the average American 12 year old. Early Boston Dynamics robots were much larger. The larger versions though were just scarier. It's just easier to find a robot endearing when it's the height of a middle schooler. No one's ever seen the most famous humanoid robots from different companies standing next to each other. But based on their specs, this is what that would look like. Here's Atlas. Here's me at 5 foot 9. Tesla's Optimus robot is 5 Five foot eight. NASA's Valkyrie robot is bigger, six foot two, and the cute old Honda Asimo is little, just four foot three. And there are plenty more. My biggest question to these companies, though, was why? Why build a human-shaped robot? We already have robots in all kinds of other shapes. Why are we working so hard to make them vaguely like us? The answer boils down to this: we built our world. For humans. So if you're interested in building a system that can start to address the current limitations in automation, a humanoid form factor is quite good. Companies are building these robots to first do things that are unsafe or repetitive or boring for humans, like some kinds of manufacturing or some tasks in hard to get places. That's why legs specifically are so important. So many of the robots that people encounter day to day, yeah. from a Roomba yep. to a more automated delivery system, yeah. they're on wheels. Why have legs? For me, legs are about access your opportunity to go more places is just better. So if I want a robot that can not only walk around a floor like this, but they can go upstairs, climb ladders, maybe I can take it into the woods or I can take it into a crumbling building. Or in the case of NASA's Valkyrie robot, they want to take it into space. Talk about uncertain terrain. Why not add something humans don't have, like a tail? So you have to think about what the function of a tail might be. The tail would have to be able to exert forces on the robot that would be significant. I'm just thinking about all the things that I wanted as a kid. Yeah. I wanted wings also. Wings. Is Alice gonna go airborne anytime? That would be, that would be pretty sweet. Um, yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah, that's a no. I gotta ask the questions. 
it's my job. Okay, so it's valuable for robots to have legs and a human-shaped body, even if it doesn't come with wings or a tail. But what really matters is what it can do. Time to put Atlas to the test. But before we get to that, let me show you something. So I've been traveling more for this show, especially internationally. And when I do that, I always wanna make my computer think that I'm still in the US, just so that everything online feels normal. My websites don't get blocked and things are still in dollars, stuff like that. The way that I do that is with a virtual private network or VPN, like Surfshark. Here, I'll show you. I can set it to the US when I'm abroad or I can set it to somewhere else when I'm at home. Look at this, I can set it to one of over a hundred different places. And the other thing is when I'm using Surfshark, it's protecting me in the background. So for example, it helps prevent unauthorized access to my camera and notifies me when someone tries accessing it. If you don't use a VPN, you might find it useful. I do. And right now you can get an exclusive Surfshark Black Friday deal. Enter promo code Clio to get up to six additional months for free at surfshark.deals slash Clio. Now, where were we? Ready? Yep. Let's go. First up, running, I crushed Atlas at running. Jumping, we can both do that. And also this. Or rolling, gotta say, Atlas is more graceful than I am. And then, the grand finale. Show off. Do a backflip. <laughs> no, there's no way. Jesus Christ. That's Jason Bourne. Yeah, no, I can't do a standing backflip. There's just no way. But hang on, if Atlas can do a standing backflip, why can't it beat me at something as simple as running? I was going really slow. Have you heard of more of X paradox? No. There's this like principle that's often quoted in robotics. It's that the easy things are hard. Uh, so basically all the things that we take for granted in how we move through the world and interact with objects, we spend no time thinking about. These are exactly the things that are extremely hard to get to work in robots. When you see a person do something impressive, you subconsciously make assumptions about what else they can do. If they can do a backflip, they must be able to jog slowly. The lesson here though is don't do that for robots. Those assumptions don't apply. So if I see a person, for example, take an amazing soccer shot that goes in the top left corner of the goal and it looks beautiful. I could probably assume that that person is really good at dribbling soccer balls. But if you see a robot do that, those other things might not be true at all. Atlas can do a backflip, but doesn't sit in a chair. Humanoids don't sit in chairs. And there's actually technical reasons for it. It's very hard to write a, a general control system that can just sit in a chair. If we spent a lot of time and worked on it, I'm sure we could do it. But I think there's just a lot of really simple, low performance, interactive behaviors that we do all day long that would be a real struggle for Atlas right now. So far though, Atlas and I have competed in predictable environments. But what about when something unexpected happens? Like hypothetically, some mean YouTuber coming to shove you over. I feel guilty already. Where do I shove it? Uh, you can shove it like right in the, the camera. That's fine. Stop, really? Yeah, go ahead, that's fine. Wow. <gasps> I'm shoving it hard. Then you go even harder. Seriously? Yeah. I can't. Wow. I'm actually trying yeah. I, hard. Okay, I'm gonna try one more time yeah. and then I'll stop bullying your robot. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Wow, I'm so sorry. If the robots do ever take over, we're just gonna agree that that never happened, okay? Okay. And besides, in my defense, I asked one of the engineers to shove me in the same way that I shoved Atlas. Would you push me in the chest? <laughs> I'm serious, I wanna be in the same exact position that Atlas was. Listen, fair is fair, but not in the head. That felt like a little much. You can see that I recover too, in almost exactly the same way that Atlas does, but I get pushed back way farther. So I'd say Atlas wins this round. These are the moments that really pique my interest. How does a robot handle adversity? Like in Tesla's recent Optimus demo, one of its blocks fell unexpectedly on its side and it seamlessly corrected it. And then this guy comes in and moves the poor robot's blocks around and it just keeps going. It's just adapting to the changes. Also, I felt so bad for it. Like don't move the poor robot's blocks around, he's organizing them. And I felt so guilty for pushing Atlas too. Like I actually feel guilt. I'm not trying to be cute on camera. Like I feel something when yeah. I push a humanoid robot. I think there's just gonna be a big learning experience for us as a society as these systems start to make their way into our daily lives. Obviously, I know that Atlas is not a person, but we're people. 
So it's just inevitable that we respond differently to robots that look like us, as opposed to, say, an automated forklift. This is one of the things that I think is most interesting about this topic. Most of us subconsciously think if they look more like us, they must be and think more like us. But how intelligent is Atlas, really? When I see Atlas throw a bag on YouTube, has a human engineer pre-planned every tiny little movement of each limb? Or have they said, get this bag from here to here, but you figure out how? Or could they just say, we're building a house, help us do that. And then Atlas would identify what to do. That might be the future, but the answer right now is closest to that middle option. Get this from here to here. The way that we command the robot to throw the bag is we tell the robot, okay, we want this bag to end up over there. You get to hold it for some period of time and we want you to do a 180. So it has to figure out, okay, how do I grab the bag and then accelerate it while I'm jumping so that when I let it go, it follows Newton's laws and ends up where it's supposed to go. And all that coordination is really complicated, right? For you as a person, this doesn't require much thinking at all. And then you're gonna jump and turn 180 and throw it behind you. Okay. Everybody do it. That way. That way. <laughs> okay. <laughs> wow, that's heavier when I try it. Let me try again. Turns out I can't do that as high as I thought. As you noticed, when you did a 180 without the bag, you did it perfectly, right? As soon as you did that, your balance is all off. And the reason is the inertia of this bag coupled with your body changes how much angular momentum you need to do in order to get all the way around. Right? And the robot has to figure out all of those details on the fly. This is making me more impressed with the level of computation that Atlas is doing and that my brain is doing. Yeah. And I'm appreciating my own body more like a robot right yeah. now. Recreating human-like movement in a robot is just very hard. And Atlas doesn't always get this right. Plus, you're learning from every new experience and failure. Atlas is not. When I'm shoving Atlas as hard as possible, is Atlas learning to accommodate that better? Or would someone need to change Atlas's programming in order to accommodate that better? Yeah, right now we're not automatically using data from the robot to improve the control system. So any improvement that comes from hardware experiments goes through a human engineer at this point. Okay, so Atlas isn't learning from every new experience, but it is learning in another way. How much is Atlas currently using what a layperson would call AI? Um, so when people say AI, they're usually referring to um, models that are created through a process of machine learning. Machine learning boils down to giving a machine a set of examples of inputs and outputs, and allowing it to figure out its own rules to get from one to the other. And so Atlas's perception system, for example, is almost entirely driven by machine learning at this point. So it frequently uses cameras in order to identify objects in its environment, in order to localize itself to its surroundings. There's other types of machine learning as well that are more responsible for generating behavior. So Instead of a human engineer painstakingly thinking carefully about you know, the physics of a problem and writing down a controller to solve that problem, uh, you actually use simulation and maybe robot data in some cases and trial and error experience in order for the system to learn how to do a task better. Based on its demo videos, Tesla appears to be heavily investing in exactly that. When they say Optimus can sort these blocks fully autonomous, what they seem to mean is that after being given the goal of blue blocks here and green blocks here, the robot can then use a neural network, a kind of machine learning system that runs inside the robot, to process visual information from its cameras and decide how to accomplish this task. Tesla also seems to be using simulation data to train Optimus to perform tasks better. Frankly, it's hard from these videos to figure out exactly how Optimus is working, but I'd love to visit Tesla and find out. The robot future that I wanted as a kid, having robots in our lives helping us do daily tasks will depend on these robots being able to understand increasingly high-level concepts and commands. If you want a robot to put away your groceries, there is a massive difference between rotate your left hand, pick up the bag like this, put the bag on the counter, then take your left hand and open the bag, versus put my groceries away. A robot needs to understand not just where are my hands, but what are groceries? And away means in the cabinet, not out the window. And also other things remain more important at the same time, like don't put away my groceries at all costs, like don't step on my dog. The more you learn about humanoid robots, the more you realize how difficult making one actually is, and how amazing the robots that already exist are, and also how amazing human bodies are. But as these robots inevitably get more capable, one question will become more urgent. 
What will we use them for? Killer robots. Killer robots. Will robots take over the world? Well, if the global robot takeover is coming. Boston Dynamics has issued a statement saying no general purpose robots should be weaponized. I asked them about that. One of the things that I'm proud of at this company is that we've taken a very strong stance, for example, against weaponization of robots, collaborating with Massachusetts legislators in order to put forward legislation that would explicitly ban the creation of such technology in the state. It seems that Elon Musk has a similar stance on this. He said, quote, that we don't want a, a Terminator scenario. But if history and Hollywood are any indication, not all robot makers might feel this way. This is likely to be an ongoing conversation within these companies and between all of us. I think many of us on this team are, are looking for ways to make these have a positive impact in the world, basically allowing people to decide long term what kind of work they want to do. And and then for the things that we don't want to do, we can have machines that'll help us keep things going. There are robots around us already, all the time, most of them static or on wheels. But humanoid robots are inherently different. Something about making them look like us fundamentally changes how we feel about them. They are more scary and more lovable because they're more like us. Making machines that look like us is one of the most ambitious and endearingly human technological moonshots I can think of. It's a creation in our own image. There is a huge if true future where humanoid robots are walking among us, helping us by doing things that we do, like taking out groceries or building things, and doing things that we can't, like running into the worst burning building or walking unprotected on the moon. Hundreds of people are working right now to make that future possible. And if they succeed, we're gonna need to think about another question, which is, what do we as humans want to do? And what do we want to give up? We have some time before we need to answer that question. But the robot future is coming. And it's up to us to decide what it looks like. Hold on, I have one more thing. For this whole video, we were talking about robots that look like humans. But what about robots that look like dogs? Oh, thank you. I got to hang out with Boston Dynamics robot dogs and you definitely want to see that video. So subscribe to support our show and to see it first.